So we are uh, incredibly uh, excited and uh, honoured to have uh, both gentlemen here uh, today who will be engaged in this conversation. And thankfully, you can say, I won't be. So you'll be very happy for that. Uh, <laughs> We are delighted, and again, so many of you were, I think most of you I recognize from last night, so I don't need to go, th I won't go through all the thanks again, right, because we did that uh, yesterday, but we have to thank uh, Burnett Duckworth Palmer as the, as the sponsor of the exhibition. <laughs> the many, many lenders uh, who uh, uh, gave of their work uh, for a long period of time uh, to make this exhibition happen. And uh, I personally, again, want to thank uh, Nate McLeod, who's here in the room, uh, who did an excellent job. <laughs> and I will withdraw my thanks to Kaylee Hall, because she didn't tell us whether or not she has given birth yet. So, <laughs> so we don't know. But uh, Kaylee Hall, uh, our, our wonderful curator, did so much for, for the exhibition. Um, we uh, are very grateful to her for that. Um, because everyone knows I'm a huckster and that's what I'm supposed to do in this part because these are going to deliver the actual content, I want to remind you that there's a book out, uh, the Kim Dorlan book, that we're very proud of. It's published by Figure One and McMichael Canadian Collection. Uh, I have a little piece in it, Robert Enright and uh, Katerina Asanova from uh, formerly McMichael, now the National Gallery, uh, has uh, done pieces. And uh, it is a lovely book, and it's available for sale, and perhaps you might be able to entice this lad to, uh, to sign them. <laughs> uh, the dialogue today is going to be rather odd, as one of our guests uh, <laughs> suggested. And I can't imagine, because uh, I think what she was really saying is, what were you thinking? What were you thinking to invite Ian Wallace to be uh, in the dialogue with Kim Dorland? Uh, could it be any more uh, mismatched? Uh, actually, I don't think it is. I think both of these artists are fanatically interested in art and art history, and they voraciously uh, consume it and absorb it and uh, rechannel it in their work. Uh, Ian Wallace, man, oh man, uh, I'm just so honored that we have uh, you here, uh, Ian. Uh, so many times we've been trying to imagine ways to, uh, to entice you here, and we'll do better, <laughs> and hopefully we'll get you here again. Uh, Ian Wallace. Uh, is a graduate of the University of British Columbia. He taught for many years at the University of British Columbia and at the Emily Carr uh, College of Art and Design. But of course, he is one of Canada's most renowned uh, uh, artists, uh, internationally acclaimed and internationally uh, exhibited and uh, heralded. Um, I can't imagine, I don't know that there's any significant uh, institution in the country that does not have a work of, uh, of uh, Ian's. Uh, he is the recipient of the Order of Canada. He suggested to me yesterday that he was about to be the recipient of the uh, Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur of uh, uh, Paris. I can't even say it, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't even comprehend how somebody uh, uh, rises to such a level, except simply through uh, decades of phenomenal contribution to uh, the, the world of art. Um, in addition to his extraordinary work as an artist, uh, uh, Ian is somebody who I particularly personally admire uh, as somebody who has remained dedicated to art history uh, and particularly to Canadian art history and its relationship to uh, uh, the international world. Uh, and so for that, uh, I am uh, incredibly grateful that he is here and uh, looking forward to your conversation. Kim Dorland, uh, not a bad guy. <laughs> um, born here in Wainwright, Alberta, and grew up in Red Deer. Uh, studied at Emily Carr College of Art and Design, and uh, has gone on, as I think you all know, since you all were at the exhibition yesterday. I don't need to go in much about it. Phenomenal works uh, that have uh, inspired us and have challenged us and have um, breathed new life, I think, uh, back into painting and into uh, um, art practice. Uh, these two uh, characters, I think, are uh, very exciting, and I hope that we'll be involved in a very interesting uh, conversation. I just want to inform you both 
that the three knockdown rule still is in effect <laughs> and no one gets so saved by the bell. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Wallace and Katie Dorland. <laughs> you mind if I start? I was hoping you would. Yeah. <laughs> um, just uh, perhaps as a little preamble before we get into our conversation. Um, i just like to say it's a real pleasure to be here in Calgary. I haven't been to Calgary for some time and uh, had a wonderful evening last night seeing a real, I mean, the energy in the city was incredible with the four exhibitions and a, a lecture by uh, a fellow artist of mine that's just down the hall from my studio, Ron Tarada at Esker, uh, last night managed to get that in. That was great. And today I had a fantastic tour uh, through the uh, galleries here in, in um, Calgary, and it was totally impressed. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know that you know I had a sense that there was a good reason to come here, and I'm really uh, happy that I had that chance. And, and thank you for inviting me to come here and participate. Uh, that, uh, on top of that, I was uh, uh, very very happy to come and. Uh, do uh, you know to support uh, Kim's show and do a little conversation here? Um, and um, uh, Kim was uh, just just to remind you what Jeffrey said. Uh, I never taught studio. I only taught art history. Even though throughout my whole teaching career, I was always a practicing artist. So I was kind of one of those people wearing two hats at once. Um, and um, um, so uh, Kim was. Um, I forget what years you were there, but you were uh, 90, a student. Yeah, 95 through 98, I think. Right, just, yeah. just before I retired in 98 mm -hmm. yep. from teaching. And uh, I've been teaching in UBC since 1967, um, and then moved over to the old Vancouver School of Art, which became Emily Carr right after that, and set up their academic program, and was really had, a, I think, a, just a wonderful academic career as an art historian, and, and having the free hand to construct an academic program for art students. Uh, not all of them, I don't know, Kim, I'd like to hear your responses. <laughs> not, not all of them appreciated my program, which was fairly rigorous intellectually, yes, I think. Yes, and it was a tough I, I, Part of my class. program is to make sure that uh, you know, students in the class knew what went on in art history, mm -hmm. knew all of the contemporary artists, could identify their work, and when they left Vancouver to go anywhere else in the world, would know who was the, you know, practicing in that city and be able to identify their work and talk about it with, in an informed way, you know, yes. instead of being provincial dummies, you know. Yes, it was uh, a very so. intimidating <laughs> class and a very. So it was it was kind of a little bit demanding, and I, mm -hmm. I you know, not everybody was on side for that. Yeah, you know, what? To tell me, what what did you think of it? I mean, just a little feedback. Well, on, I loved on it. On me, um, this but, is all about you. But yeah, so no, we'll start that's, talking about me. <laughs> I mean, we all sort of would meet after class, and uh, we would discuss the class. And uh, I never met anybody who didn't love the class. I, we were all very challenged by the class, <laughs> very challenged. And we all had jokes about how if we asked you a question about an artist, you somehow managed to have 10 articles for us right on hand, like this, <laughs> to read by the next class. So we always joked about that. But I, I think you were the most respected teacher in the, in the school. It was, it was such a great class. So, really thrilled to be talking to you again. Uh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. There's it was nice too because... My reward. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also really nice because um, um, when I was in school and even now in my practice, I wasn't a highly conceptual artist. Um, and uh, I was approaching my work in a different way, I think, than many people were. Very much about the material, the subject, even though I sucked back then. But I was a student, so. <laughs> Not at all. I remember you as a very curious, really eager, kind of bright-eyed, yeah. very ambitious young artist. Slightly angry. Yeah. And, yeah. and you, you always had something to say. So, yeah. I mean, that was great. That, and then I ran into you a couple of times in Toronto at openings mm -hmm. and that. Yeah. And uh, so when uh, Jeffrey uh, contacted me about coming to Disney, great. Yeah. And I saw articles about your work in the magazines and that sort of thing. And I'm always so happy when I see former students moving ahead professionally yeah. in the art world and getting some recognition. Yeah. So it's, it's always been my politics and my program to be there in support of the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, I was just at uh, the Gordon Smith Gallery, Artists for Kids Gallery at a gala event in Vancouver, and I very much support that gallery, which is all about education for children, mm -hmm. art education for children. Um, and uh, you know, right up to 
supporting and uh, paying attention to all my colleagues. Mm. Even the people whose, like your own work, is about as opposite to my work in mm -hmm. a way as you can get. Even though there are some areas where we really you know, cross over, I think, I think in, in how we approach representation mm -hmm. and abstraction, modernity, and, 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 uh, and what we have to say about our personal experiences. We'll, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jeffrey's comments on being mismatched, uh, <laughs> they're astute comments. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm known, uh, A, as the kind of the intellectual type, uh, and, there's, and that's true, mm -hmm. you know. I read philosophy regularly and, and uh, think things out, mm -hmm. maybe a little too rationalistically, even in my work. But, um, and of course, I'm the so-called godfather of Vancouver photoconceptualism, uh, which, uh, according to some people, tried to bury painting, uh, which was <laughs> not true. Uh, but that's part of the myth. Oh, that's part uh, of the myth, yeah. And uh, so uh, bringing, you know, my perceptions into contact with your practice, I think, is, is an astute and, and interesting, and I think w when we get our conversation going. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just say... Um, rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I was, I was alluding to before is, um, even though I wasn't coming at my work um, in a similar fashion, I never felt judged by that, and uh, you actually were able to talk about my heroes in ways that other uh, teachers weren't, so I was interested in Baslitz and uh, Kiefer, I was oh, yeah. a big fan of the Germans, and uh, maybe now I'm not so interested in some of the, uh, the, the uh, neo-expressionist painters as I was back mm -hmm. then. You humored me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I was one of the, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I was one of the few people in my circle in Vancouver, which includes like Rodney Graham, Jeff mm -hmm. Wall, et cetera, et cetera, Mark Lewis, and me, who really saw something that was happening in Julian Schnabel's paintings, mm -hmm. for instance. Yes. Uh, you may, you know, I used to talk about him in class. You yes. Know, as the antipode to my approach, mm -hmm. yet an artist who really did something reinvigorated painting in, in many ways, to my eye, anyways. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. he was an artist that was really disregarded and put down and highly criticized. And, by my colleagues, yeah. who I also supported. So there was a dialogue going on. Mm -hmm. And that, that's kind of what I like about your work. And in many ways, to my aesthetic, it's challenging. And in many ways, I'm really jealous of the incredible <laughs> gusto and freedom you show in your mark making, mm. which I don't have in my own work. Yeah. And uh, I'm quite jealous of that. Well, thank you. It <laughs> <laughs> was a good compliment. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember the, the Schnabel thing. I remember you. The, one of the few things you said to me that really stuck with me is you have to lose your Schnabel influence. Oh, okay. And good, so I good. destroyed most of those paintings right oh. after that. Because I was basically doing poor man Schnabels yeah. back then because I was <laughs> considered myself an abstract painter. And uh, thankfully, uh, I dropped that. I mean, I took from abstraction and uh, infused it into my own work. But uh, yeah, I, I, couldn't do, I couldn't take the deep dive into abstraction. It just didn't suit me. Well, it's important work. you had to find your own voice, mm -hmm. and you have. Yeah. And that's great, you know. I mean, yeah. You can identify a Kim Dorland painting now, mm -hmm. right? So there, it's your work, and I that is so. already something. Yeah, and, that's, you know. Yeah, the touch. When you realize that you have the touch, and you have um, your toolbox, and I think my toolbox is quite large, but um, it always kind of comes back to that, that Dorland thing. Um, and um, I've never found it limiting. I've never found it um, because I'm. I just. I'm always interested in pushing myself in, uh, uh, always challenging myself to be to be better, to do something different, or to follow a different train of thought. So I, I don't feel like I'm just ripping off these kind of paintings really quickly with that signature. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it does. It happens to be that way. Well, when once done. you find your voice, I mean, if you want to hear the voice of experience here, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I did my, I exhibited my first work in 1965, which is almost 50 years ago, in the Vancouver Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, that gives me a little bit of authority of experience, I think so. I yeah. But, um, you know, once you find your voice, you, you want to hang on to that. Mm -hmm. Like, don't keep jumping puddles from one thing to another, but I don't think you do. I no. mean, you have enough flexibility in your vocabulary, technically, and in subject matter, mm -hmm. that you've got a long way to go. Oh, I think you know, so. I yeah. feel right now like I have more ideas than time. Yeah. And it's a nice feeling to right. have. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I, there's a mantra that I always say. I don't know how accurate it is and, you know, criticize me. I would say, like, every artist has only about two or three good ideas in their lifetime. <laughs> the challenge is to take those three ideas and spread it out yes. over a lifetime and yes. keep the work constantly fresh. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. It's, I'm sure it's a text from my wife in Vancouver wondering what I'm <laughs> yeah. doing right yeah, now. Yeah, what are you up to right <laughs> now? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. Um, I feel like really all I'm doing is painting pictures of my family and my experiences and portraits of my family. And, uh, you know, it's, there does seem to be enough there to keep me going for a very long yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. And uh, as you move through life, those experiences will change. Exactly. It's almost perfect yeah. in a way. Because yeah. um, I'm always like, even today I was out with my family and... Um, being able to recognize those perfect moments and to quickly take a picture of them. I mean, that does, sometimes my camera gets in the way. But, um, but to, to recognize that, like, oh, here we go. This is an experience I want to remember and potentially paint and uh, get down in some way. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about the difference, one of the differences between your work and my work uh, is that, well, I think of my work as paintings, even though most of the surface of my work are straightforward photographs mm -hmm. laminated onto the canvas, mm -hmm. uh, combined with abstract painting. Um, your work is 100% painting, but it's derived from photographs. Mm -hmm. So photography comes into your work through the back door, in yeah. effect. I so, always viewed your work as paintings, though, in a weird way, um, especially back when I was around them a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, we always sort of spoke, in them, uh, spoke about them in a painterly way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I see them as paintings. Yeah, yeah they, the, the language is definitely... Yeah. Especially since the early 80s when I started mm -hmm. laminating on canvas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but even before they were on canvas, when even when I still exhibit works that are just photographs, mm -hmm. but they're presented and informed very much by a painting mm -hmm. and the history of painting. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to get into questions about painting and what you think about the future of painting and <laughs> the, you know, and, yeah, you know, this sure. whole question of that, you know, came up particularly in the 70s, painting is dead, you know, Wallace is trying to bury painting with mm -hmm. photo photography. And I must say that it's true in the 70s and right through to the present, I see the photographic image is providing a kind of a critical relationship to the pictorial mm -hmm. history of painting. And, and, and is, in a sense, superseded painting in mass media, for instance, in oh, representation. Yes. Uh, but as a result, I think of, like, uh, from as I see it anyways, of um, you might, the, the advent of the age of high technology representation, mm -hmm. like the, the cell phone the photograph, phone. Yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, now, every, you know, every, the world is being replicated photographically in an enormous incremental uh, increase it than, than, than one could ever have imagined even 10 years ago. It's amazing, yeah. 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 But that's, as I see it, that's kind of returned the interest of what I call the function of painting as the landing pad of subjectivity. In an area of high tech representation, we have to find our subjectivity, which is, I see, our humanness, mm -hmm. our imaginations, our soulfulness, our spirituality, is symbolically now finds its way back to the handmade work again. And painting, as I see it, symbolically has become, you know, that quadrant that goes on the wall has mm -hmm. become the place, the landing pad, where, you know, the subjectivity of the public at large, in a sense, fi in a sense finds its landing pad, its, it's place to look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We look at paintings in order to, to refract our own sense of humanity mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, the I think handmade aspect the handmade of object. is really important. Yeah, yeah. I, um, this is going to sound like a weird uh, example, but I saw an interview with David Bowie. He was talking about his paintings. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of his paintings, but mm -hmm. um, he said, you know, people get tired of looking at photos. Um, sometimes they just want to touch a piece of wood. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's that handmade thing mm -hmm. where you can recognize the artist working um, uh, I, I think that gives people comfort. Um, and uh, speaking about photography and the way I use it, um, 
uh, for my current show in Toronto, um, Ben Portis wrote a, a little write-up about how my paintings actually refer to the cell phone. Um, and I thought about that because I actually didn't think about it until I read it, <laughs> which so often happens when you're talking, when, you're, when your own work gets discussed. And uh, I recognized that in a way I was using the photo, um, the, the image that you're taking off your phone, my child in the alley mm -hmm. on his bike. Oh yeah, the alley number six? No, they, he's walking in that one, yeah. Yeah, or um, there's one where he's riding his bike. Um, it's mm -hmm. in the new oh, Toronto yeah. show. And um, it was this perfect moment. And on the camera, right, there's the four moments. Where you're like click, 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 click. And so there was the one, you know, he's smiling at me, but there was the one image where I caught him off guard and he was about to fall over and it was, I was like, well, I have to paint that, it's perfect. And I liked the idea of something so random and something so quick slowed down um, with the act of making it. And I think in a way that slow down goes over to the viewer as well. And I, I think that it causes, um, I hope that my work and my relationship to painting just causes the viewer to slow down and consider what's on the surface. Because um, I find myself I'm really overwhelmed by technology and uh, the way images are uh, thrown at us all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really unnerving. Yeah. And uh, for me, painting, the reason I started painting thick was actually a really dumb, thing, I was really tired of the discussion of photography and painting. And this was sort of the time of like Luke Toymans, mm -hmm. uh, Magnus von Pleissen, who you don't really hear about anymore, and uh, Richter, who's a god, everybody loves Richter. But it was always this conversation, photography, painting, and, and they, it was like they couldn't exist outside of each other. So I just made these dumb marks on my paintings to remind the viewer that they were, it was material. It, it was, was paint. painting. Yeah. yeah. And it was really simple, yeah. but that's kind of what drove me. I hope I'm not rambling, no. but uh, <laughs> that's kind of what drove me to get into the more material element of my own work. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the issue about materiality, in other words, the means of painting and the act of painting, of course, is one of the tropes of modernity and modernism and modern mm -hmm. art, uh, that the subject matter retreats into the background mm -hmm. and the material comes to yes. the foreground. Uh, but uh, in, you might say, the so-called postmodern development of representational ex expressionist or mm -hmm. Malarish type painting, painterly painting uh, since the 70s has brought back subject matter. And of mm -hmm. course your work is a classic example mm -hmm. of a very successful kind of reconfiguration between representational values and subject matter mm -hmm. and the painted and material and the painted yeah. materiality. In other words, the, the element of pure modernist kind of representation, modernist handling of the actual form, mm -hmm. formal materiality of painting rather than the subject matter per mm -hmm. se, you know. Um, well, there was, but, I don't, you must remember what happened to painting um, in the 80s and 90s beyond the, you know, beyond the sort of expressionists and um, the material painters, there was this other thing that happened and it was conceptual painting. Oh, yeah, and it yeah. really absolutely sucked the life out yeah. of painting. And like, like Ron Tirado's work, for instance? Um, I'd, not Ron Tirado. <laughs> no, well, not I, I, would call, I would call him a conceptual painter. Oh, for sure he is. But maybe more um, where the painting was trying to illustrate theory uh, uh, more than discuss other issues. Um, like, it got to the point yeah. where it was a formula, right? You have your photograph, you have your bit of paint, yeah. and you have your text, and then you have the text beside it that's right. this long that describes why you should enjoy the painting. Right. Like, and that was an absolute like, reaction on my part. I couldn't hmm. take it. <laughs> like, like Baldessari or somebody like that? Or? Well, there were some Vancouver people whose names I can't remember that I remember reacting very strongly to. Oh. Just like this Me? is... No, not you. Because <laughs> I've no, done that. <laughs> I know, but I actually always appreciated your work for the formal elements. I, yeah. I actually really liked them as yeah. objects. And then I liked, the, you know, I liked what else was going on. But I, my first and foremost experience yeah. of the work was on a very sort of almost painterly yeah. level. That, so. That's good. I always tried to put it together. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, in my intellectual interests, I always like to also, because that's me. Yeah. I have to have that embedded in my work, sure. otherwise it's not my work. Yeah. And, of course, those elements make my work mine and distinct mm -hmm. from somebody else's. Yes. Right? Uh, and I'm not the only one to do that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would even peg my work as being a form of conceptual painting. Definitely yes. informed by conceptual art. 
Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I glibly mentioned Ron Tarada because he gave the talk last yes, night. Yes, I, I very know. good talk. I really enjoyed it. And he's one of my very favorite artists. Yes, he was. I, he's, he's he really was good. a student of mine, actually. Yeah, and, and I remember again, him from Opus. Years ago. Yep. Yeah. And um, so you know, his interest in conceptual art, but he also had to react against it too. And he talked about that in his talk last mm, night. I would like to have yeah. seen that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, what I'm against in in so-called conceptual painting at that level is this uh, purely pedantic diagrammatic aspect. There has, you know, the sensuous aspect of painting is what we love. Yes. Right? It's what draws us into it. It's the it. best yeah. part. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I'm jealous of your Malariche, <laughs> of your impasto, because I don't, I don't use any impasto in mine. No, I, I don't think, I haven't seen it. Well, I do, um, <laughs> uh, some of my works have uh, um, um, uh, ink monoprints uh, taken from plywood, mm -hmm. and I was, Use the worst quality degrade plywood because it's got the most novels yes, it looks in the it best, yeah. to create that visual grip, mm -hmm. and then of course it's inked and on the floor, and you lay your canvas down and dance on the back, you know Jackson Pollock style, and pull it off and merge it with the photographic element and, and such. So mm -hmm. sometimes my work does have that kind of touch, but yeah, it's mostly pretty clean. Uh, you might be influencing me to go dirty. I don't know. We'll go see. Go dirty. You know? I think it's funny, though. People think that um, I get asked funny questions about what it's like for me to paint, and it's actually quite dull. Um, it's very, it's not, it's really quite considered, and I think if everybody knew that my average brush size was like, a, you know, an eighth inch, <laughs> they'd be really surprised. Oh. Um, it's very um, calculated and um, less expressive than you think. Mm. And those expressive marks are often thrown on after everything else is sorted out if that makes any sense. So for example, the painting in um, the show of my son, I think it's actually my favorite painting in the show, mm -hmm. of my son walking and it's his back. Okay. And it's got that kind of iPhone blue background. I can't remember what I titled it. But the alley? <laughs> no. It's in the first floor yeah. as you come down the stairs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think my mic just went, no, no, no. Uh, there's one I think called um, The Alley, isn't it? With, there's two people standing near a trailer and that. No. Oh, Alley, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, Alley, yeah. Alley number six or something. I, I was yeah. focusing on that. Uh, there's one where you, you did your painting, and then there was kind of a rotation of arbitrary swipes yeah. around yeah. it. Um, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit forgetting which one that was, but it was one like the Alley, or yeah. it was somebody walking down a street with their back to us. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And it, and I really like that. It's like you did the painting, and then you just really had to dig into it once more. Yes. Right? Well, because I'm really Those interested marks, in yeah. f frustrating yeah. the act of viewing. Right. Because I find um, I was always talented enough to make convincing paintings. And that was the frustration sort of up to 2005, right. before I did the painting called The Loner. I was really awesome at realism, and then I was really good at abstraction. And I could make these things that were convincing, but they had no... Um, that's all they were. And so I would get frustrated and destroy them all and start again, right? So it's this dance. Um, and then, but all of those things sort of came together. But the one thing that I, I, I realized that I always wanted to do was to frustrate the act of viewing because I don't want to make just beautiful things because yeah. that's boring. <laughs> so that's why, th so those elements that you're talking about were usually after the painting was pretty much there. Like when the painting's about 90%. Then you go in and figure out, okay, well, now it's, how do, I, how do I wreck this, but make the wrecking of it as interesting as, uh... <laughs> anyway, make the wrecking of the painting just as interesting as, as if, you know, as, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> the, the question of beauty, I mean, I, I like to bring the term beauty into the discussion, even of conceptual art. Um, the, uh, but beauty is, in the mind of the beholder, of course, everybody says. Mm -hmm. Of course, Keats said, truth is beauty, beauty is truth, um, which is a pretty good definition, actually. Mm -hmm. If something is honest, straightforward, real, original, full of vigor, love of life, mm -hmm. it's going to be beautiful. Yes. You know, it doesn't matter what is supposed to be beautiful or supposed to be ugly. Mm -hmm. The generic beautiful is not necessarily beautiful. No. Not to my eyes, anyways. Not to mine either. But 
you know, a sunset is generic. And you've done some beautiful sunsets yeah. in your paintings. Is generically beautiful. Very generic. I don't know beautiful. any sunset that isn't beautiful. No, it's ridiculous. And how can you say it isn't? You know, yeah. And yet, yeah. and and you know, that's the hubris of humanity. You know, like competing with nature. It's pretty hard. Oh, isn't it's it? a, yeah. no. And you know, you know, you're a cynic. You're, you've turned into a cynical person when you tell a sunset to fuck off. You know what I mean? <laughs> That'll be like, your next painting. Uh, <sighs> Come on. <laughs> well, I did, I did a number of sunset paintings, yeah. and uh, it was actually that idea. Yeah. Just like, why don't I do something that's impossible to paint? And uh, it's so loaded with tackiness that let's see if we can make that thing happen and make it interesting, like make it beautiful, but also you know, frustrating that beauty yeah. and then and arriving at something. And so uh, I, those were challenging yeah. paintings. Yeah, I was looking uh, just before I came here. I, um, I forget the name of the attendant at the gallery, he let me in because it was locked at mm. six. And I had another look and I was thinking about the hot pink undergrounds that mm -hmm. you use. And I figured that's really unusual. I mean, to have to paint a serious painting over a hot pink underground yes. on a consistent level. I was sort of getting down to real technical things no, here. No, that, that's... But, um, uh, and, and in terms of what you said about dissembling a painting on that level of, of beauty, I mean, hot pink is a beautiful color. It is. You know, it's we, the best. We, you know, it, it, it makes a great party dress. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, but to make a serious painting out of that is not easy. It's not so easy. So I notice that you take hot pink as a ground, and then you can merge, you know, you bring all these other colors and marks and smears over the surface to kind mm -hmm. of, but you let those little glimmers of that hot pink peek through, you know. Then I was thinking, pardon the art historical references here, so my very famous Tiziano or Titian, I mean, the Venetians painted over a kind of a Venetian red yeah, underground. Yeah, the red color. Yeah. So they painted over a red underground. Mm -hmm. And then I realized they were the first painters on canvas, really, because mm -hmm. they used the heavy um, jute canvas yes, yeah. with a strong nubble surface yeah, the nap, on it. Yeah, the and of course, painting. Titian's great, just like yourself. So you're really inheriting the Venetian school here. Well, you know, dragging the brush across those nubbles, yeah. he used that like to liven the surfaces yeah, of fabric and, yeah. and Well, and such, even yeah. a lot of the good Tom Thompson paintings, he had oh, that, yeah. that rusty color yeah. underneath. Oh, that's right, too. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, for me, it was, um, there were two things that were happening. I was working on a series of paintings, and I was working with, um, I was teaching myself how to glaze with acrylic, like to get different colors from white. And it was really dull and boring, and so I did this coat just to, 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 I don't know, it just sort of suited me. And it, and it actually taught me how to paint in, in a more classical way with layers mm. and uh, glazing and so on. Uh, and then it occurred to me that um, these were colors that I saw all the time. And uh, I realized that, um, as a kid growing up, I mean, and I realized that in a way it was, uh, it was a way to insert my class growing up into my work, mm. this kind of mall culture. Um, I've made no bones about saying that I grew up white trash. Yeah. Um, not my entire family. Uh, they were you know, very, very working class poor. But my mother and I were pretty trashy. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, through no fault of my own. And so I, I always thought that that was a nice way to insert that kind of punkish uh, kid into my work. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's remained you know, it, it refers to all the malls and all the, sh the, the cheap t-shirts and stuff like that that I saw growing up. Did you uh, paint graffiti on your jean jacket? Uh, no, I couldn't afford a jean jacket. Oh, no. I, that was meant to be really funny, <laughs> but it... <laughs> I, got a, I heard of one snicker and then people were like... That sounds pathetic. Yeah, yeah, right. It's just terrible. <laughs> Don't bring it down, man. Um, yeah, Sorry, I, mean, I used to put newspapers to cover the holes in my shoes. Yeah, yeah. You know, which were white bucks in the 50s, right? Oh, right. I managed to be able to paint the shoes white, so, but I wouldn't let anybody see the soles of my shoes. Yeah. Which were like right through to the ground. Wow. Right? Yeah. Respect. Yeah. Pathetic. <laughs> yeah. That's really pathetic. Yeah, here. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's kind of where I thought. And then, you know, as my, as my work evolved and my style evolved, it just doesn't feel... It's just uh, natural, as natural as buying uh, you know, iron oxide black because it's mm. your favorite black yeah. or whatever. It's just the way that the paintings start now. How do you start a painting day? Tell, tell me how your day starts. Uh, well, I have two young children, so they dictate a lot of my timing. Uh, but generally speaking, I drop my kids off at school. And um, 
I think people are usually pretty surprised by my studio because there's no seating, there's no, uh, there's no food around or anything. It's, pr it's pretty much just business. Um, I have a stool, I have my walls, I have my, you know, my work up, and I just work the entire time. Um, maybe someday I'll you know, slow down a little bit. Um, but it's very much just working on the task at hand. Um, there's no, I, you know, I make, a, I make a very strong coffee, make a big bottle of bubbly water, and then I, and then I go. Do you have people around when you're painting, or do you have to paint alone? No, I have assistants. Uh, they don't work on the paintings at all, but they do things like get my surfaces ready, pack the work. Um, I, I have this art supply store that I go to because they give me a good deal, but I can't stand the people who work there, so I make them do that stuff. <laughs> um, they're really incompetent. Uh, so I, I'm used to having people around, and mm -hmm. I chat the whole time, right. and I have music up painfully loud. Yeah, I sense that. Yeah. I sense that. Looking, I hear the music. Yeah, I just, yeah. It, 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 for me it's actually a focusing thing. Yeah. It's like how some people need total silence. Um, it helps me just take everything out of my brain. Yeah. I was thinking uh, that you use a paintbrush the way a musician will use a guitar. I think you so. Know, so I, I, I hear the music when yeah. I see the paintings. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, it's just, uh, I've been really lucky. I've, I, it's nice to be busy because it, it forces you to, uh, you know, I, like, you know, the old Chuck Close saying, In inspiration is for amateurs. <laughs> you know, waiting for inspiration. Oh, yeah. yeah you got to push through it and you got to work. Um, actually, the, the best way I've heard myself described, and I, I kind of liked it, um, somebody told me that I paint like an athlete. And I really think of it that way, you know, with that kind of drive and force. Yeah, when I have no ideas, uh, I just walk into the studio of artists next to me in my studio building and photograph their floor. Oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> but you're just, lucky you have a lot the, of... Just kind of the cutaways of Elspeth Pratt or somebody like that. Yeah. You know? And then I make, uh, make pictures from it. Hmm. Yeah. It fills the vacant spots in my brain, and they turn out to be pretty good pictures, I think. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. That, that yeah. kind of uh, yeah. happenstance is always yeah, really interesting. Yeah, they're about nothing, but they're about some pretty Everything. important things at the same time. Yeah. You know? And it's also about looking at the stuff that you're not supposed to be looking at. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the things that are thrown away, the abject, you might say, which is a real trope in Vancouver art. Mm -hmm. Vancouver artists really love the abject, things that are not worth anything and thrown away in the corner, et cetera, et cetera. You know? An artist's studio floor tells more about that artist than a lot of times their work does. It's like asking somebody, what do you have in your fridge right now? and they list it off, and you can kind of get a sense of that person. The artist floor kind of has that feeling to me, too. Yeah, I, in, in my work, I do a lot of masking uh, in, through various stages of the mm -hmm. painting of the photographs to protect the photographs from getting painted on, etc. But I love that kind of rough state of the work, mm -hmm. and I photograph it, and then I do big inkjet prints mm -hmm. of the various stages of the collaging and masking of the finished picture. And then often, when the finished picture is shown, I show the, the process Amazing. of it at the same time. Yeah. And kind of, it's a nice way to flesh out a show that mm -hmm. doesn't yes. have a lot of big yeah. ideas. <laughs> that, <you> know. <laughs> but uh, these are always the challenge of artists. You know, yeah. like you, How do I fill you got, the space? You've got a lot of wall space to cover, and it's got to be good, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, yeah, you can only buy yourself so much white space around yeah, right. the work. Yeah. And, and Unless you turn that into a piece, too. That's, a, that's another thing that really impressed me about your work. I mean, like... Uh, over the uh, the show here, it's really only 15 years, but incredibly prolific. I mean, what a body of work over 15 years! I say, really, yeah, amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, to, thank you. To, I mean, that that body of work is from 2005 to yeah. present. Yeah. yeah so, and, and the scale of the work too. It's, it's really. Yeah, I've heard I've heard lots of different views on that on my on my, on my uh, prolific nature. Um, you know, you, get, you, you must be used to people in your ear all the time about what you're doing wrong. Or maybe oh, they yeah. don't, they probably don't do that. I'm repeating myself too much. Yeah, yeah or you, yeah. you probably don't hear it as much as I do, yeah. cause, but um, I hear it a lot. And uh, I just, I don't understand how you change your process. I happen to work quickly, I happen to work big, and I happen to make a lot of work. And uh, I don't think the work is uneven, you know? No. So, I, so um, I'm really proud of that. It's like telling, like Van Gogh did 450 paintings in three years. 
You know what I yeah. mean? And I know it's really romantic to yeah. look him back and say, oh, but look what... But, like, do you think somebody was in his, in his ear yeah. saying these stupid things? That's such a curatorial thing to say, you know? Anyway, <laughs> that's my uh, rant. Another thing that knocked me out was your ability to handle scale. Uh, and that shows up in the catalog. You have a reproduction of a painting. When you look at the scale of the painting, it be like, you know, uh, 10 by 12 or 16 inches, like fairly kind of quite small scale mm -hmm. work. And you look at another one, is like 10, 12 feet by 6 feet, mm -hmm. you know, uh, really very large scale as we see it yeah. in the show. Um, but the ability to, hand, to do a really small painting with immense sense of scale in it is really something. I think, did you get that from the Tom Thompson paintings, those beautiful small sketches that are in the Thompson, yeah. in the McMichael uh, yeah. collection? They always amaze me. For They're insane. Sketches, yeah. the, the amount of, yeah. of what he was able to put into a painting this big is so beyond what so many people, you know, what many people could never do in their entire yeah. life, you know? Yeah, that, that, uh, that kind of focused energy in a small piece was definitely from him. And uh, yeah, I just always felt comfortable working in any scale you know each scale presents its own challenge you know you couldn't do east view sev you know this big yeah. <laughs> you, or maybe you could i don't know but i don't i don't think so but um yeah it's it's a very comfortable thing and it's more it's just intuitive like when i go back to work um you know i i plan on putting up quite a few small panels to get myself back into the into the game a little bit, and then I'll start fleshing them out bigger. But it's, yeah, it's not, it's really intuitive. It's not, you know, I always feel very defensive, but it's not business. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to make little work so that they, they can be more affordable, and I can, you know, it's not about that. Or you can carry them around to shows a bit easier. Yeah, I, yeah. I, well, they would I, ship I, better I, for that's, sure. That's what I'm thinking of. I'd like to start making smaller works. Yes, yeah, so uh, because it, shipping can be very, very expensive. Yeah, it's uh, a nightmare. Yeah. Now mostly the galleries pay for the shipping. Yes, of course. But at one time, I but used to have to. But they complain the whole time, right? Yeah. Well, no, I, I <laughs> personally don't get hear that. But at one time, I had to do the shipping, and I had to. I would roll up my, take them off the stretchers from Vancouver, roll them up, and I always designed the paintings to be able to take them on an airplane mm -hmm. as baggage. Yeah. yeah, and it, the total dimensions of the work for baggage is no more than 108 inches, yep. including length, width, etc. Mm -hmm. And so I take them in rolls and then have the gallery provide stretchers at the other end. And stretch them there. And stretch them up. Yeah. Yeah. My first show in Calgary was like that. That's oh, so, why the yeah. loner's that weird shape, because I brought it on the plane. Oh, I, I had a question about that. I mean, these are like uh, shop talk. I think people <laughs> like that. People like shop talk. Um, I think. Like your work has such impasto, so you means you can't roll them up. No, those they, I can't roll, yeah. yeah. And then I want to ask you about the wooden backing mm -hmm. to, like you stretch the canvas over plywood panels, I assume? Yeah, uh, just a ma like mahogany, I think it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, yeah, and sometimes I, you, ha you actually bolt things in. And, yeah, know. so the only reason I do that is um, a lot of paintings could be fine just stretch on linen or something like that, but I like the option to be able to screw into it, yeah. because sometimes a piece will end up getting so thick, and I don't pre-plan it, right? So I do like to have that option of, of being able to screw it in to support it, uh, so they don't fall off. Right. And there's this annoying thing that happens with my work where the pieces of oil drop and roll down and just wreck everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's really, it's really quite pragmatic. And then uh, I've developed a really uh, low-tech shipping system. <laughs> What do you mean low tech? Like I just, I build little corners mm -hmm. and they screw into the back and then I just cover it with triple ply cardboard. It's really oh, I see. quite so, simple. So the card, nothing touches nothing, the actual yeah, surface. Yeah, it's like a... Because you're big glops on the faces yeah. and such. Is that a fair word to use? Glop? Glops is totally cool. <laughs> yeah, it's totally gloppy. Um, if you had any, you know, kind of flat surface pressing yeah. against it, that would wreck the yeah, you texture. Yeah, you get that yeah. flat thing that happens. Yeah. There's a one painting, uh, the 36 Olympic Green, yeah. Um, that painting sold in 2006, and I actually got the painting back. I had to trade a bunch of my own work to get it back. But I noticed that they didn't pack it right, and there's a smushed piece. And cool. that kind of, yeah. It's not such a big deal on an older painting because the paint shrinks and, mm. and so on. But, uh, That's such annoying. a beautiful painting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just, <laughs> I was happy to get I mean, that back. I really felt that I was there mm -hmm. uh, looking into this window, Suburban window where there's a warmth inside. Yeah. You know, when you're outside in the, in the chill, mm -hmm. and it's in, in, you know, we've all experienced that. Yeah. But, but <laughs> you caught it just beautifully in that painting, I think, you know. 
And then I was reading your interview, and then that was very that was a that very was meaningful house. address to you. That it was, was that's the house I, that took you in. I crashed the middle yeah. class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's so how I crashed. That's a, I think it's a fantastic work. Yeah, I saw when I saw it again. I'd forgotten about the painting, and I saw it again, and I actually didn't even recognize it. I was like, oh, that's my painting. I love it. And then so I wheeled and dealed to get it back. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. so you own it now? I, that's mine now, oh, and it, it's not going out you. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could afford to get mine back. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a, ter it's a terrible thing, though, when you're trying to make a living. Like, I make my living yeah. from this. Yeah. And uh, er after a few years, you realize, you're like, oh, I should have kept that one. But, you know, you have to make a living, and you yeah. have to yeah. get the work out there. Yeah. Yeah, I keep some for myself, but my wife is always trying to get them off me, even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kids even are starting. Yeah. They're so little, and they're bugging me for paintings. Yeah, yeah. but they're going to be theirs anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a whole list of things to talk. Should I bring out my cheat the sheet list? here, yes. or we come sure. to the end of it here? And we could probably take questions or or whatever. Yeah, too. yeah. How about let's bring the audience in <clears throat> here too. Sure. Join us in our conversation. Just wondering if, if there's uh, any any urgent observations or, or questions that uh, that other people want to have. Everyone knows I have questions. So. <laughs> I, I was just wondering. You were talking about looking into a window. I, I don't know the story behind that. Oh, um, so I was. Uh, Long story short, my mother was uh, not the nicest person. And so when I was 16, she kicked me out. And my wife's family took me in. And that's kind of where I discovered art. And uh, like I joke about crashing the middle class. But I don't know. There was, a, there was a, a huge unpredictability in my life. And then there was predictability in my life. So that's kind of uh, was a very transformative time for me. And I spent many years painting that time. So the 36 Olympic green painting is sort of me as the outsider viewing that place. And uh, I'm actually in the painting with Lori, who's my wife, who couldn't be here tonight, and her sister. It's a very plain sort of suburban painting. My mother kicked me out too. Yeah. 17. But I needed to be kicked out. It yeah. Was, it was good for me. Well, good. <laughs> yeah, I moved into a house in downtown Vancouver. Well, other art school students were in, I never went to art school, but other art school students were in that house. It was like a five bedroom house downtown, renting for $65 a month. My wow. rent was $11 a month. Nice. <laughs> this was 1962. Um, and I met my wife. She was really? going to an art school party, and she was there, and we fell in love. And I have my son, and I have grandchildren, and everything, all from that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, these uh, things. So it was good to be kicked out good. of the house. It's good in the know. end. <laughs> It sucks at the time. Own nest. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I, I think both of us it sounds like we both kind of landed on our feet and yeah. then made and, something. And, and a little bit of your story too. For me, art was the means. I, when people say, "Why do you become an artist?" I say it was just a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like I learned to write poetry in order to seduce girls. <laughs> you know, it was a survival mechanism. Yeah, and I, art <laughs> was that. You yeah, know? yeah, it was my ticket out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is being filmed. I have to be careful. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you just hear those things a lot, and uh, you can't teach a student. You can't teach a student what the art world is going to be like because, I'll, first of all, when I graduated, the art world has changed so much <laughs> that I don't even understand it anymore. Um, so you really have to make your own way. And I always had a kind of an Albertan attitude about it. I just didn't, like everybody would say to me, you know, you can't just go up to a gallery and ask them to look at your work. You have to go to their openings and meet the right people. And then, you know, and I was just like, was really red deer about it. I was just like, but why can't I just go in? And so that's what I did. And so I think that maybe, maybe that kind of pushy attitude bothers people. I don't know. But you hear these things and uh, you just have to learn to kind of put them away. But that's one thing I hear all the time. Kim Dorland makes too much work. And, uh, you know, I don't really care. <laughs> They're just jealous. Maybe. Or maybe not. I don't know. But uh, what are you going to do? And I actually, well, it sounds defensive, but I actually don't make that much work. You know, I think Picasso, in one 
spent the last years of his life to get a painting a day for 365 days. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful show in the south of France. Of the 365 paintings in Gagosian a couple of years ago in New York, had an exhibition of some of those paintings, mm -hmm. the Moscateros, and, and of course Andy Warhol. Part of his, his uh, artistic uh, thing was to do multiplicity of the images, mm -hmm. to do a whole gallery of the Campbell Soup cans, mm -hmm. and the multiplication and the, and, and the rhythms. And uh, when he did a portrait of Ethel Skull, you know, he, she thought she was getting one image, and she went over to this studio. Warhol had 26 of them <laughs> on yeah. the wall. And yeah. She said, you must be joking. And, and uh, so I, I think your reaction to these people, don't you find that I always try to tell my children that when someone gives you a criticism, it says more about them mm -hmm. and their insecurities, and that you have to kind of just say, I feel so sorry. <laughs> yeah. You're so unhappy, so yeah. you give that back. I mean, there are a lot of unhappy campers in Toronto. It's such an <laughs> unfortunate city. <laughs> are, are you able to, are, are not as beautiful as Calgary. Uh, Calgary's beautiful, no doubt. But are you able to do that to say, I'm so sorry, you're unhappy? The way, for me personally, I don't, I don't know about you, but um, I just shut my studio door and work. Yeah. I just, and that's, and just ignore it. Yeah, that's all you can do. Yeah. You can fight and send emails to people and really get wound up in it, but who, it's a waste of time, I think. I like criticism. Yeah. I mean, I try to solicit it, yeah. uh, but people are so intimidated by me, they usually don't <laughs> want to, yeah, to I can see put that. me down, you know, not to my face. Anyways, yeah. You know. yeah, no, I'm sure you're behind um, your back. Um, and uh, because, you know, so artists do that. You mm -hmm. actually do a work in order to provoke a response. Yeah. Uh, yeah. About those Picasso shows that Gagosian did, and, and related to Kim's work, yes. the one up on Madison Avenue of the portraits of his children. Yes. Paloma and Claude playing with their toys. Freaking like amazing that artists can do such beautiful paintings of their kids playing with their toys mm -hmm. in the, you know. Yeah. And, and, but and it's not saccharine. No, they were beautiful paintings. And yeah. your paintings kind of touch upon those kind of very intimate, mm -hmm. private, personal moments that are not of the grand subjects of historical painting, yes, yeah. but are really about our everyday life. Mm -hmm. But they, they've got the power of great painting. So, you know, that's a you, beautiful you hit it. You yeah, hit thank it. Yeah. you. And, and that's, I really learned something from that because I'm always looking for the subject that needs to be told. And Picasso just doing pictures of his kids, that was a lesson for me. Mm -hmm. And Bonnard's mistresses in oh, yeah. the yeah. 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 Well, even those Jack Chambers paintings, those oh, yeah. stunning Jack pa yeah. Chambers paintings, just of his children looking yeah. out the window and there's the Christmas tree. I mean, they're yeah. just the most banal yeah. subject, but... Was that road trip painting, the big one, was that inspired by the Jack Chambers 401? Yeah, well, it, I, it, not directly, but yeah. once I started doing the painting, I immediately recognized yeah. that, and yeah, I was it, totally it, cool with that. I kept thinking of that. Yeah, no, it's... You know, it's an iconic painting. It is, and it's yeah. a master... Yeah. Not mine, his. It's yeah. a masterpiece, yeah. so totally... Well, yours will be. Yours yeah. Well, I'm, yeah. you know, I can't say that. <laughs> Happy with the painting, but... And also, too, um, I really was interested in Doig's uh, country rock painting. Mm -hmm. I loved that kind of yeah. road painting and that beautiful rainbow. Um, so, but I mean, influence uh, is not something I've ever run away from. It's nice to be yeah. able to hear that, you know, Jack Chambers brought up in relation to yeah. my painting, and, yeah. and hopefully those, those little threads can go all over the place. Yeah. All right, you made a nice comment in your interview with Robert Enright in the catalog mm -hmm. about influence, mm -hmm. about having to go through the influence yes. and then claim it as your own. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, that's what artists, how artists speak to each other. I, I mean, so. influence is not something to be afraid of. No, and so many people yeah. just won't even caught, they won't even admit it. Well, look at the rock music world. I mean, mm -hmm. there's constant exchange of riffs and influence yeah. and sound one to the other, mm -hmm. yet, you know, in the, I mean, artists are extremely competitive um, yeah. for all kinds of good reasons. Yeah. Uh, and to find your own voice and your absolute originality in the in an incredible number of artists out there doing incredible work mm -hmm. and how to, to stand out yeah. of the crowd is really, you know, we're all competitive, at least the, the us macho type artists like me. I you know, will fully admit uh, to It's being really a challenge. Yes, you know? it is. And it is very much like... Um, 
there is that kind of uh, instinct, right? That sort of killer instinct yeah. when you're making a work. You want it to be the best, and you yeah, want only, it. Absolutely. Well, John Curran said it best. He said, if you don't think you're the best artist around, you're fooling yourself. Um, I'm a little more humble than Maybe. that, but still. <laughs> no, but I liked, I liked the sentiment of that. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just totally He's portrayed myself. He's a survivor, yeah. sort of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you don't see him so much anymore, yeah. but. Um, but that, oh, sorry. This is probably a perfect segue. Yeah. Uh, fantastic uh, conversation. And I'm so glad that you brought up uh, the business of uh, Robert Enright and, and the interview, because um, uh, not as if this has been completely, totally charming and uh, enlightening, but we'll have another opportunity uh, here in Calgary to uh, have a conversation with mm -hmm. him, uh, with uh, Robert Enright, on November 27th? Is that right? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think it's November 27th. So, uh, uh, we are uh, very, very delighted uh, to have had uh, this conversation this evening and uh, have this great uh, dialogue. And uh, I know there will be other opportunities for people to uh, come out and uh, say a word or two to uh, these two gentlemen. And once again, because that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. That was nice. fun. That was nice. Yeah, that was really nice. <laughs> Pretty. I declare it a draw. <laughs>